That's why this morning's release of our government's unclassified estimate of what took place in Syria is so important. Its findings are as clear as they are compelling. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. Read for yourself, everyone, those listening, all of you, read for yourselves the evidence from thousands of sources, evidence that is already publicly available. And read for yourselves the verdict reached by our intelligence community about the chemical weapons attack the Assad regime inflicted on the opposition and on opposition-controlled or contested neighborhoods in the Damascus suburbs on the early morning of August 21st. On August 21st, chemical weapons attacks in Ghouta, a neighborhood of Damascus, Syria, claimed the lives of at least 355 people, according to Doctors Without Borders. What we all saw was an inordinate amount of children, scenes of which went viral on the internet and propelled the United States to send five destroyers to the eastern Mediterranean with an undisclosed number of nuclear submarines, all of which are laden with cruise missiles, all ready to send a clear message to Bashar al-Assad of Syria that chemical weapons use was crossing the red line President Barack Obama drew one year ago. While on Monday, Secretary John Kerry and his U.S. State Department claimed Assad's guilt was a judgment already clear to the world, other mainstream media outlets disagreed, reporting that there was no smoking gun and that the evidence was no slam dunk. In fact, the evidence was all based off a report and analysis of Israeli Surveillance Unit 8200, our equivalent of the NSA, not exactly an uninvolved actor in the region. Many problems, of course, arose immediately after the attacks in Ghouta. While the Syrian government is purportedly the largest stockpiler of chemical weapons in the world, the opposition has them too. Now infamous video has allegedly shown rebels killing rabbits with ad hoc mixtures of chemicals procured from Turkey. Other reports have acknowledged chemical weapons depots have also been seized in rebel gains. On August 23rd, LiveLeak.com hosted an audio recording of a phone call broadcast on Syrian TV between a terrorist affiliated with a rebel militia in Homs, Syria, and a Saudi Arabian boss identified as Abdul Basit. The phone call indicates rebel-affiliated terrorists in Syria, not the Assad government, launched the chemical weapons attack in Deir Balba in Homs, Syria, one of some 14 alleged chemical attacks pinned on President Bashar al-Assad. World Net Daily hosts a litany of these YouTube videos showing rebels handling chemical ordnance and alleged nerve gas missiles. Adding to the confusion is also the potential use of Muammar Gaddafi's stockpiles, which were at one time feared to have fallen into the wrong hands, at the very least left unsecured amidst the NATO-backed no-fly zone and the ensuing melee during the revolution in Libya. The concern his weapons were transferred to Syria was highlighted in the Benghazi affair and further supported by Bill Gertz, who recently reported that 20% of the Mujahideen doing the majority of the fighting in Syria are from Libya. But most importantly, the UN's Carla Del Ponte officially acknowledged suspicion rebels had in fact used chemical weapons. Yet even with all the counter evidence, mainstream opinion while against involvement in Syria believed Assad was still to blame. This is prior to a UN chemical weapons investigation having even been concluded. Much of the media is evidently still on the assumption as well, as CNN in classic pre-Iraq style and obviously with copious amounts of notes from ESPN are walking around a life-size CGI war theater resembling the state of Syria. So is there anything to the Saudi connection suggested by the post at liveleak.com? Well, we know that Qatar and Saudi Arabia are spending billions of dollars providing weapons to Syrian rebels. We know that Saudi Arabians host live auctions sending suicide bombers to Syria. Saudi Arabia and Qatar alone funnel millions of dollars to the rebels every month. But as Arti's guy in H. Chikan reports, it's not just cash and weapons being smuggled into Syria, but ideology as well. This is said to be an auction taking place at a hotel in Saudi Arabia. What's on sale is a human life. The video shows a father offering his son as a suicide bomber into Syria and raising money as compensation. We know that geopolitical interests of these two predominantly Sunni nations stand in sharp contrast to that of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, all of which are Shia, and in the case of the latter three, have recently signed a $10 billion gas pipeline leading directly through Syria itself. 
This undercuts, as we covered in our interview with Eric Dreitzer yesterday, Qatari and Saudi energy interests. Now in a breaking article by longtime Associated Press Middle East correspondent Dale Gavlak notes, from numerous interviews with doctors and Ghouta residents, rebel fighters and their families, that many believe certain rebels received chemical weapons via the Saudi intelligence chief Prince Bandar bin Sultan and were responsible for carrying out the deadly gas attack on August 21st in Ghouta. 26 rebel fighters lost their lives that day. And according to Gavlak, it's because these fighters weren't properly trained in handling the weapons given to them. According to one resident of Ghouta, his son who fights with the rebels and 12 others were killed inside of a tunnel used to store the weapons provided by a Saudi militant known as Abu Aisha, who was leading a fighting battalion in the region. The father described the weapons as having tube-like structures, while others were like a huge gas bottle. Gavlak also reports that more than a dozen rebels interviewed reported that their salaries came from the Saudi government. But here's the kicker. According to UK's independent newspaper, it was Prince Bandar's intelligence agency that first brought allegations of the use of sarin gas by the Assad regime to the attention of Western allies in February. Now, the Iraq parallels have been hammered home in the last 72 hours, to be sure. So some might say it's appropriate that Prince Bandar, or Bandar Bush as he was called in those days, is back in the narrative. And if this report proves true and accurate, Barack Obama, just like George W. Bush, the CIA, and Colin Powell will have bought into the sweet, crude, scented lies by a man who's outlasted popes and presidents. And rather than further humanitarian goals and a responsibility to protect, American strikes will have advanced Saudi Arabia's top foreign policy goal, according to the Wall Street Journal, of defeating Assad and his Iranian and Hezbollah allies. A lot of people on the lunatic fringe, as it's derided these days, have been wondering who Obama really works for and whose interests he really serves. According to this report, the answer is more than obvious.